I think I'm ready to introduce our friend. Again, I'll, I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Chris Moore Backman. I'm part of the core team at East Point Peace Academy. And I'd like to introduce two other members of the core team. Astrid, uh, who will be helping with tech during this um, evening together. And Kazuhaga um, is also a member of the core team at East Point. And for those of you who don't know about our organization, um, historically, we're very well known for doing nonviolence training and conflict reconciliation training in the prisons and jails uh, here in the Bay Area of California. Um, and in addition to that work, we've, we've done community-based workshops um, about nonviolence, conflict reconciliation, uh, and are embarking now on kind of moving uh, in terms of our focus into more of a balance between the training we've been doing as well as movement building. We're working. I'm the one who was lucky enough to sort of draw straws to be able to introduce Dominic Barter to you. I'm guessing that most, if not all of you are already familiar with, with Dominic's work. And Dominic, I wanna actually introduce you by, by way of offering thanks to you for various things. Um, yeah, thank you for your pioneering work on developing the restorative circle model that you've, you've done such incredible work on and with communities in so many different places. I wanna thank you for the way that you've impacted so many of us in terms of the way we think and behave in relation to the flow of resources in our lives and our communities through your financial co-responsibility model. I wanna thank you for the innovation, the incredible creativity of the dialogical social, social systems model and principles that you're gonna be sharing with us I believe this evening. And I think at the bottom of my thanks to you, I wanna, I wanna offer my appreciation for the way that all of these models and principles for you come from lived experience and experimentation in the place that, that you are. These are not theories that, are, that you're sending down from, from some institution or the halls of academia. They're coming from lived experience and, and from the living of your own life, which I believe is a very beautiful life. And you model a beautiful life for us. And I thank you for that. And lastly, I thank you for being with us this evening. I know how incredibly busy you are and um, I'm grateful for it. And I believe I speak for many, many people right here, right now that are very grateful as well. So I'm gonna hand it off to you, Dominic. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you, Astrid. Thank you, Kazu, and everybody else who's there who's, who's made this possible um, and for the invitation and for that lovely introduction. Um, I accepted because it was you three that asked me um, because I'm also incredibly inspired and strengthened by the work that you're doing the things that you write, the way that you open up your learnings and connect so many different people uh, in ways that bring up to date and renew very ancient understandings, um, but which I don't see being refreshed in the way that you're doing them in very many places in the world. So um, I want you to know that, that I also have a lot of gratitude to you and it's delicious to be here in a space where I feel there's a reciprocal influence and nurturing going on your work and the work that we're doing here. And welcome everybody who's joining us. Um, thank you very much for, for your time and interest. Um, I smiled a couple of times when, when uh, Chris was speaking, he, he's very, very, very gently saying, you know, there may be breakout rooms or, you know, some principles that I believe that Dominic might be sharing. Behind that is that he knows perfectly well that I have no idea um, what I'm going to do with you all, um, partly just because of the, the, the busyness of the time and 
um, so much caring being needed for so many people around us meant that my day was much fuller than I hoped it was. Um, but also on a deeper level, because I don't have any answers for any of you, uh, I also don't know what's going on. Um, just before I got on the call, I was just chuckling at the, at the title, you know, where do we go from here? I haven't got a clue where we go from here. Um, all I know is that um, I hope we go together. Uh, it, it's not about having an answer, having a, a, a vision or a concept of what would be an ideal society or how do we deal with moments of extreme crisis like this or what are we going to do with the consequences that, of, of what's happening now that we're going to be living with for the next few few years having these ideas, these theories, these grand plans, and then trying to implement them, even if they're our great ideas. I have fantastic ideas to work the world out, but I don't want to live in a world which is designed by the ideas that even the ones that I have, let alone the ones that anybody else has, because if there's one thing that's pretty clear uh, through history, it's that every time we try to implement ideas that we have preconceived before of an ideal society, we end up with authoritarian nightmares as a result. So rather than say, these are the, these are the plans, let's implement them, and then let's fight whatever resistances they naturally, healthily bring up, or let's fight reality if perhaps our ideas uh, just don't respect basic the basic organization of life on this planet. Instead of doing that, maybe what we can learn to do is to find out together the best way to take care of life in every configuration as it arises in every new moment. So that we're not actually conceiving of the perfect plan and then applying it, but working out as we go the best way to include and nurture all forms of life in the way that we're currently living in the circumstances that we have. And the, what I'd like to share with you this evening comes from small-scale experimentations in applying those same principles, not to the whole world, but to discrete but interconnected social systems each of which both provides uh, a specific transformation as well as an opportunity to learn about possibly doing this on a larger scale. So they are, they are rehearsals for not a world which will come about at some point, but they're rehearsals for coming to terms with a state of being in rehearsal, a, a state of ongoing unknowing, which doesn't seek to cure itself with some kind of future clarity or, or insight, but will, will be ongoingly informed by evaluating to what extent what we just did nurtured life or didn't. So um, that's the game that I thought we might play together for an hour and a half this evening. Um, I hope you'll uh, talk to me, interrupt, ask questions. As Chris said, I won't be able to see when people are raising hands, and I can't see anybody's image on the screen. I can just see um, myself, which is rather disconcerting. Um, and one of the reasons why I might do that sometimes, looking away from the screen, just so I can uh, think without this guy looking back at me. Uh, but Chris will, or Astrid, will see people raising their hands, and then I hope uh, facilitate some um, some interaction, and also suggests um, a couple of dynamics that we that we might do in smaller groups. And when I do that, then um, then Astrid will help uh, give us all partners in a breakout room and, and create a space for you to be able to talk amongst yourselves. Um, and then we have like a live example of one of these mini social systems, dialogical social systems that we've been playing with over the last twenty five years which Chris just mentioned, which is financial co-responsibility, 
which we might play with for two reasons. One, to have a live example of what it feels like to taste some of the work that I'm talking about. And two, because both me and East Point uh, rely on the flow of resources from folks who've been nurtured by what we do in order to be able to pay our basic bills and keep going. So we hope this evening will also be a way to contribute to the wonderful work that East Point is doing and to keep me and my colleagues going in our work down here in Brazil and around the world. So when I woke up this morning and I was thinking for the few minutes I had before the day began, I was thinking, okay, so today is that day that I'm going to be speaking English, kind of change the little program in my head because I've been doing a lot of these events and they've all been in Portuguese almost every day for the last few weeks. And I was thinking, well, what do I want to say? And the first thing that came is the most obvious thing. And I hope it's something that you reflect on every day. But I know that with everything that's going on, I often forget, which is that the world is beautiful. In infinite ways that constantly change and, uh, and are renewed and that's extraordinary. It's endlessly extraordinary. And it's, there's, there's something fundamental, unquestionable, non-ideological about it. The concept of beauty gets messed around by ideology, but the fact of there being something in the world which my body registers as being of, of beauty is this constant reminder that there must be some correspondence between what I'm seeing and appreciating and the organism that is seeing it. So there must be some unity that underlies all the infinite richness of difference between all of us and between us and all the other forms of life. And Reflecting on that, oddly, is often better, easier at times of extreme crisis when our ability to pretend that death isn't a fundamental element in existence is interrupted by circumstances beyond our control, which is what's happening right now. We're having the, the fiction of our um, our endlessness interrupted by something which um, reminds us that the time is now and that the choices are ours and that the, the consequences are for everyone and everything. It doesn't um, mind if we like that or not. It's um, indifferent. It's, it's just... It's just the, the, the arrival of a fact. And then who we are is who we are in relation to that fact, how we live in the, in the sphere of that, of, that, uh, of that unquestionableness of what has emerged. I'm here in Rio. In Brazil, uh, the daily war of civil society here doesn't end even a moment like this. Um, we lost a 14-year-old boy, um, shot multiple times in the tummy as he played in his own house yesterday in a police raid. We lost 13 people on Friday massacred in a police operation. The, the consequence is the colonial project, this war of apartheid, which is indistinguishable from daily life here, continues. And yet, this is still an extraordinary moment. Um, I know of uh, 15 people who've died in the last few weeks, 13 directly from, from the virus. I imagine that most people watching, if they don't know of anyone in their own personal life, in their own family, and they know of people in the families of others, 
or they know people who are connected to friends or colleagues of theirs. Something about a time like this brings all that uh, very much to our mind. And, and so there are many, many things that we could talk about because of the unique conditions that we're in. Um, we need to talk about what does it take to develop uh, social spaces where it is welcome, uh, interpersonal relationships, where it is valid, um, personal elasticity sufficient to be able to mourn so much loss. So many losses. We need to be able to engage critically and and with rigor with the rise of authoritarian solutions which emerge and present themselves as they always have done in the past as being necessary responses to terrifying dangers. We need to talk about what's going to happen when with each new crisis that emerges, the social fabric gets ripped further apart and we enter into distinct realities, distinct understandings of, of facts um, and lose the ability to dialogue across the, the differences of political opinion, of, of medical opinion, of, 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 of positions and identities. There are so many questions at the moment. And we've chosen one um, for this evening, which is just as important as all the others, but which is perhaps a little bit different because it's focused not just on an immediate uh, present peril, but also on an extraordinary possibility. And that is that in the last few months, as has happened throughout history, the crisis and the suspension of uh, what was called normal life that has occurred has opened space for the emergence of thousands upon thousands uncountable networks of mutual aid. An extraordinary um, emergence of community self-determination that has created uh, innumerous different connections between people who are either already in relationship, but not like this, or who simply didn't talk to each other because they didn't know each other because they'd never started, or even people who were pretending that they didn't live together, like people who live in an apartment block or neighbors on the same street or people in the same neighborhood. And we see sometimes just the most superficial, um, the most non-explanatory manifestations of that represented in memes or in the newspaper or presented to us as a kind of beautiful sugar sweet story about how human beings are lovely and uh, you know kids have been drawing rainbows and 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 things like that but it's almost we almost never investigate actually how did these networks emerge how do they function they're they're considered unfortunate but beautiful but moving manifestations that uh, temporarily fill the gap that normally is occupied either by the state or the sphere of private enterprise. But at the same time, there's a skepticism about them, if not an, a, 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 a definite fear about them, because they do substitute the state and private enterprise. They remind us of our, our community, um, the, 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 all the words come in Portuguese to my head because that's how I'm used to talking about this. Um, they remind the, uh, us of the, of the, of the, of the strands of, of connectedness in our, in our community life and that these other things actually came from them and often seek to substitute them in a kind of a jealous insecurity wherein 
the, the logic of services and, and, and buying and selling the ability to be able to do something, to be able to share something, for instance, share someone to live or share a lift or, or, or share a particular ability that we've, that we've developed. They remind us that all of this is actually disconnected from its origin. Its origin is that we freely uh, interact in ways that, that allow all our skills and our abilities and our curiosities and our interest to, to mingle and produce something that, that belongs to the commons. So it, we're, we're introduced to a beautiful story about these networks, but we're not actually introduced to how they function and how they emerge and what their potential is. And then the idea is that when we return to normal life, we'll say, thank you very much. Your, your services aren't needed anymore. Will you please go back to uh, buying and selling what, 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 we, what we present as being as legitimate? And my question this evening is, what does it take for these networks of mutual aid to conceive of themselves as such, to become conscious and therefore political entities and to develop into what I'd call a dialogical social system so that they can ongoingly replace, interact with, transform the institutions and the structures of society that we currently have and that are increasingly presenting themselves as being both internally incapable of fulfilling their stated mission, our attempts to create systems of health, are often both unhealthy and do not provide health. Our attempts to create systems of justice are often unjust and do not produce the kind of community well-being and cohesion that, that, we, that we are seeking. Our economic systems, uh, that, that isn't an economy. If the meaning of the word economy is to take care of the house and all those who live in the house, that's the original Greek meaning of that term. The house, both in terms of where we live and in terms of the planet, are not being taken care of. and those that is all species in that house are not being taken care of in a sustainable way by the current way that we're distributing resources. So these systems are failing both internally and they're failing because they are part of an ecologically unsustainable proposal for continuing life on the planet. So that's my question. How do these networks identify themselves as such and how do they transform into something which has which has ongoing life, which has, which has uh, consistence, not as a new institution, but ongoingly as something that is intentionally vulnerable to its own usefulness. So something which doesn't intend to perpetuate itself. It doesn't want to become an organization. It doesn't want to have a board of directors. It doesn't want to congel itself into something which then defends all influences of change and tries to define itself as a new miniature state or to reduce itself to a company buying and selling and trading in, in objects which fundamentally don't belong to it. It, it. it welcomes the fact that it will be ongoingly vulnerable, ongoingly susceptible to change. So that's that's my question. What what is it that we know about that, and and what is it that our experiences over the last twenty five years playing with these little miniature social systems? What what have what have they enabled us to 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 learn and perhaps to help uh, systematize about this about this process? So I want to uh, share with you a couple of things which I think may be relevant to that and then invite you to hang out with each other for a few minutes in a group of three. Um, maybe reflect on a couple of things that I've shared or, or, or share your own experience with each other um, and then come back and let us know and then we'll take the next step. So um, oh, how nice. I wonder if you can hear that either now or you're going to be hearing it in the next few minutes. In, in the next few minutes, the evening news is going to come on the television. And when it does, not every night, but most nights, there is an almighty racket as people come, hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people, come to their windows, open their windows, and make as much noise as they possibly can with whatever they have. 
has assigned the, the current government that we have in Brazil, which is one of the very few governments in the world which completely denies what is going on, um, is not welcome anymore. So you may find that there's a, a soundtrack to the next things I'm going to see, I'm going to say, which is deliciously relevant to our subject this evening. Um, so, um, the first thing isn't particularly dramatic, but it, I, I found it very useful to conceive of it in a, in, in a one-line phrase for myself, which is that the first sign that you have that you are acting non-violently is that you will be accused of violence. So the moment that you do begin to consciously question how a network has emerged, inviting people to think of that network as a, as a political entity, an ongoingly socially relevant uh, phenomena that, that orchestrates powers and capacities and talents and curiosity of multiple people to produce something that individually no one would be else would be able to produce. The minute you, you stop being satisfied in just being something temporary and, and, and generous for other people, something that actually critically questions and engages what's currently going on, then you're likely to receive resistance. And one of the ways that resistance will emerge is that you may well find that you are accused of doing exactly the opposite of what you're actually doing. Some of you are nodding your heads and going, yes, I know that thing. You may know it in different terms. There's all kinds of different ways to describe it. Other people are going, no, that's never happened to me. For those it's, for whom it's useful, I hope it is useful, if only to know that you have company in noticing this phenomena. For those for whom it's, you've never seen anything like it, I'm glad. And yet, I'm still hopeful that if, at some point, you do experience that resistance, that at least you'll know, oh, yeah, I don't think I'm the first to have to go through that. The second thing I notice is that what happens next after that moment of resistance will define the way in which everything else I do is seen. And the criteria that I'm looking to take care of in that moment is congruence with what it is that I'm proposing. So wh whatever it is that I propose, I want the next thing that I do after resistance to be as close to the spirit of what it is that I'm proposing as possibly can. So talk about that as being about being more congruent, but actually, what congruence is available to us in this moment? You know, even, even, even this top, apparently, 65% of the cotton in here was produced under conditions analogous, analogous, analogous uh, close to, I can't remember the word in English, <laughs> uh, to, to conditions of slavery. Much of it by children. What kind of congruence is available? as we hear, sit here looking at these, these machines also produced in conditions which are unsustainable both for human well-being and for the natural resources of the planet. So I like to talk about it for myself as being microscopically less incongruent than the world around me. And it's extraordinary how the tiniest move towards being less incongruent is visible and has an impact on others. So, for me personally, the way I understand it is that the minute I start what I'm doing that day, I make a prior commitment to welcome the resistance that I experience, to welcome sabotage, to welcome being undermined, to welcome whatever dastardly tactics are used to try and knock me off balance, to try and poke holes and limitations, internal contradictions 
to name the future damage that people fear that what I'm doing will bring. And I welcome that because what I'm seeking is to create a dialogical social system. So if I resist opposition, if I resist adversarial dynamics which provide counterpoints to what I'm, to what I'm doing, dialogue is over before I've even begun. And then people know, ah, oh, right, when you use the word dialogue, you mean you. I thought that maybe when you used the word dialogue, you meant dialogue. You mean your ideas, you mean your friends, you mean your way of thinking, you mean your ideology, you mean your political position, you mean your advantage. So the first thing I want to know is that by doing something that invites change, I invite resistance. And the second thing is that the way in which I respond to that resistance will condition everything that happens next. So, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to, to jump into groups if you would like to do that and hang out with each other. Just talk a little bit about what you've heard so far and principally about what it is stimulated for you to reflect about experiences you've had or things that you've heard that other people have had. You may currently be involved in some, on some level, whether it's family, neighborhood, organizational work, some kind of affinity group that you're part of. You may be part of new initiatives, new community networks that are directly related to the pandemic and its consequences. You may be already involved in work that is of that configuration and already has been for a good, good amount of time. Or you may currently not be, but you're either being benefited by the fact that other people are, or you're close to, you're aware that it's just one step removed from you, and you're looking at it and wondering about it, wondering about its relevance and about your possible participation in it, whether that's online or in the street. You might be uh, quarantined in some way. You might be in isolation. You might be part of those people who are on the multiple front lines, the obvious ones being medical, but so many people are doing so much work in order to create the conditions for other people to be in isolation. So on some level, all of us are connected to, to what's happening. So when you go into those, uh, those three groups, you may find that the, sorry, those groups are three, you may find that the other two um, new people you're meeting for the first time in that group uh, are coming from very different perspectives. So you'll each be speaking from a unique experience and some of you will find points of intersection in your experiences and others won't. So I hope you all had an interesting time meeting each other and uh, it would be wonderful if we could hear from uh, maybe uh, three people about what your experience uh, was like in the room and particularly if you have a specific experience that relates to what I'm talking about that you'd like to briefly share with us? Thanks. Uh, well, I, I just, I think I wanted to share something we, we spoke about and I think it was common to the, the three of us in this short space of time that is, uh, it was like this uh, eagerness to belong and to share like uh, uh, some way of of being part and and build and also a fear of uh, the the like this avalanche <laughs> it's the wording mm -hmm. uh, of opportunities you have uh, and we see but uh, not not an actual answer of not 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 an right or a, a specific clue of how to choose, you know, because I, I think there is this some this energy, and I realized myself and we spoke about it, uh, the the need for support around us, but I also feel and felt with the two people who were with me, this um, need or. Uh, wanting to share a project or something we could engage on different uh, or more specific or something that gave us a sense of belonging, like even bigger, I don't know. I think that, uh, and I, I, I wanted to share it because 
in so, so such a short time, I felt it was something common to the three of us. And I'm in Brazil, one is in Australia, and the other one is in the US. So it was nice to see that. Yeah, I really resonated with the uh, that, you know, three very different stories. And I guess what arises for me is that um, I'm already part of a, a large movement that w was already rooted in um, sharing risk and already experiencing those prosperities of closer connection and then we had that leap into the internet space and sharing that with the support groups, the external world support groups, sharing the skills that we'd learned. But already there's the pull in the normal world to go back to everything as normal. And there's also the pull in the, in the organization to want to go back to everything as normal and speaking up for modeling the possibility of coming out of this as if everything had changed. And the resistance that internally arises in that, no, no, we've got to go back to the same methods that we had before. Mm -hmm. But everything's changed. The things we were asking for and we're told weren't possible like the planes coming down and people coming out of their cars. No, that wouldn't, wasn't possible six months ago. Suddenly that's happened. What else is possible? Mm, so yeah, it just really resonates. The resistance is there and immediately you spoke to me and suddenly I realized, yeah, what I want to do is run away and hide again. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's not what to do. Thank you. Great. So um, one of the things I love about the emergence of so many of these networks and certainly the people that I'm connected to and supporting or the smaller networks that I'm involved in just on a community level um, is that the people who started them basically discarded the question how. They didn't answer the question how. They didn't, they didn't come up with a... a a particular game plan basically they just turned to the person next to them and said i'm going to do this or why don't we do this or something's going to happen now i don't know what to do do you and through that conversation something emerged and their experience of going through what emerged in some ways in terms of transforming into a social system could actually be seen as more valuable than the immediate good that their network provided. Because it's becoming conscious of the experience that you have and then evaluating it, which is the first step in, at least in my experience, in, my, in our work, it's the first step in transitioning from a network to a social system. It's when you look back at your own, uh, your own journey, a journey of hours, a journey of days, a journey of months, and you start to reflect on what it is that you now know that functions. So you start to become conscious of, of course, the, 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 the value that you produced, the, 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 the time that you wasted, the mistakes you made, the places that you got lost, the discoveries that you made, the feedback that you've received, the partnerships that you developed. But you start, you start asking yourself that very, very fundamental question. What works well in what we're currently doing? What doesn't work well in what we're currently doing? And if you're like us, then very, one of the very first things that you noticed when you did this, and in fact, I've never seen a... Uh, a, a moment of community self-determination that started to be conscious of itself. I've never seen this happen 
and not include this observation very, very early on. People notice that the, the extent to which they are able to consistently produce positive results for themselves and for others is the extent to which they are nurtured, the, which they are fed, which they have what I would call an empathic support system. Of course, they need all kinds of resources, abilities, maybe material resources, technology, all kinds of different elements are important. But if they're not in some way nurtured in their ability to maintain, to, to maintain themselves true to what they are doing, and then their ability to continue to coexist with each other as they move forwards, then they are under-resourced. And however generous they are, if they are undernourished, then they transition into a dynamic of sacrifice, which is a service and no longer a network. And when we replace our collective ability to produce results with the idea that someone or some group of people are going to selflessly make it possible for us to move forwards, then we've created a highly unstable and unsustainable model for ourselves. And as a society, we have repeatedly done this thing. We repeatedly elect, even in very small groups, people who will take us forward. And some cultures have almost like a kind of a religious tenant of talking all the time about leadership, about the idea that someone will make the path that I will follow, or I will be the person who, that, that makes the path. And when we do that, we focus all our attention on, on leadership, on the idea of isolated, uh, brilliant people who are different from others, who have this this special capacity that will enable them to, I don't know what, and relieve me of the responsibility of actually walking with them and creating something together. Um, we've, we've, uh, we've immediately limited the extent to which what it is that we're, that we're doing will have the kind of revolutionary potential that we're looking for. Leadership is an isolated concept. Support is a community concept. So when I look at what we have done, for instance, our work in building community justice systems, then transitioning that work from the margins of society to into the formal justice system, it's absolutely clear that each stage of our ability to do that was conditioned by the extent to which those people who were moving forwards at that time had adequate support. So they had a competent company, people who had explained to them where they were, they had an understanding of what they're doing, all those things were important. But the specific quality of support I'm talking about is different from that. It's a, it's a, a sense of, of having human company. It's focused much, much less on what it is that you're doing, what you're saying, what your ideas are, what your plans are, and much more on, on our ability to be able to be with each other as people. So I'm listening far more, important, far more fundamentally to who is speaking and less to what it is that they're saying. I'm far less interested in the ideas that I have, the, the help that I can give to whoever it is that I'm with and focused much more on being present to their current experience and then below that experience to the possibility that they are celebrating or mourning, that they are filled with or that they are feeling the absence of something which we fundamentally share, our, our shared humanity. So that's one of the possible things that you discover when you start on the basis of just a few hours or days, weeks, months of experience, when you start to reflect on those things that are working and those things that aren't. So that's something that I would encourage people who are involved in some network to do in the most simple way. Do it on your own, do it with other people. Just sit down with those two questions. What is it that we know that works well? What is it that we know that doesn't work quite so well? The second question seems rather odd because wouldn't it be obvious? We already know what doesn't work well, but I often find that groups of people 
are made up of individuals, each of which have individually identified the behaviors, the procedures that aren't functioning. But because there hasn't been a moment of formally recognizing that collectively, they haven't actually decided to let that behavior go. Some of the reasons why they don't let it go is because they believe that, that the only reason it's not working is because they're not doing the particular behavior well enough. It's a personal failing or they're pathologizing themselves as in some way being inefficient. We use a lot the concept of skill as a mask to beat ourselves up when the things that we're doing don't produce the results that, they want, that we want. Much less often do we sit down with others and say, have you noticed this thing is not just tiring and ineffective, but it's actually contradictory to what we're actually doing. How about we just stop doing it? Even if we have no idea what to replace it with, just clear more time, clear more space. So, You are muted. Wait a second. Can you unmute yourself? Am I back? Yes, you are. Great, thank you. So I want to ask that question of myself and I want to ask it of those of my colleagues who are willing to do that uh, with us. What's, what's valuable here for me is that by starting as a network, regardless of any kind of experience or knowledge or any answer to the question how, is that simply by starting, we have created an experience that we can then evaluate as having been effective or not. Fantastic. So I've got the beginnings of the ingredients to become conscious of what we're doing and for it to transform, take that first micro but very significant step towards becoming a, a self-conscious system. Then the, the, the third question that I'm going to ask takes me to a whole other level. This is the question where, based on the very little experience I have, I start to ask myself, the thing that we're doing, the future of which is unknown, how am I going to know that that is not reach some kind of future stage that I project. But how do, I, how do I know that the path that I'm on is a path that will lead me to ongoing learning about taking care of the need that our network originally was born to attempt to meet? And I do that by this very strange operation of imagining, dreaming, what it would be like if it was aligned with that which is most significant to me, and yet holding the strategies that emerge from that very, very lightly. I fully engage with putting them in place, but I don't invest myself in them producing any kind of result. It's fabulous if they fail, because I learn from that. So making that kind of pact with other people, a pact where you are willing to experiment, not where you attempt to achieve, has this, for us, well, this, this, this delicious audacity to it. It's, it's, it's playful in a way that feels almost illegal. What do you, what do you mean? Like when, when we first started understanding that we were going to create a public education system, that it wasn't going to be supported by the city, by the state, or by the, the federal government that we were in. It wasn't going to be a private education system. It was going to be public. It was going to be welcoming of everybody who came. It felt almost impossible to, to think it. Of course, the, the doing of it was like, oh my goodness, it's going to be super complicated. But before we got to that, even if it was only a few seconds before, just the fact that we could think that it could be possible to do that gave us this sense of kind of naughty conspiratorial excitement, which is a really uh, beautiful indication for me that something powerful is coming down the line. 
And sometimes we don't experience it with that excitement. We experience it with, with, with significant trepidation. So financial co-responsibility, which Chris mentioned at the moment, and which I'd now like to invite us to play with a little bit. The first time it occurred to me that I was going to stop charging and stop paying. It was the same level as that ticklish audacity that I mentioned when we started imagining the beta space education system. But it was, it was the flip side of that. It was, it was terror, like kind of an existential, like expelling yourself from the earth's atmosphere. Like, why would you do that? Why would you put yourself into endless freezing cold darkness? where you would just float and meet no one. It sounds um, rather dramatic, I realize, but that's, that's what was happening inside. I was, I was doing that thought process at that moment uh, on my own. I hadn't understood as deeply as I do now how essential it is to have uh, empathic support when you, when you do these things. I was working on whatever resources I had available. I experienced that not as an exciting moment of risk, but as a terrifying moment of doubt and uncertainty. And yet, there's something fascinating about that. It's fascinating to do something which is completely out of my, uh, my frame of reference. And the fascination, the curiosity, is the, is the most valuable for me uh, stimulus to move forwards. I'm not looking for answers. So I don't reduce anything to technique or skill or any other superficial co-optation of research. I'm not interested in, in, in finding out if there is a right way to do it. I'm interested in asking the question. And that makes me just as excited by mistakes as I am by by discovering something that, that, that maybe works just that one time or even something that consistently works. I've found very few things that consistently work, but I've also found that you only need very few things that consistently work for, for a social system to actually begin to grow and even to, to gain a little bit of scale. So a little experiment for us all with that, um, with that same dynamic. If we had uh, another hour, I would ask those very same questions to all of us around the question of how do you sustain materially the ongoing availability of a certain, a certain um, possibility that you value? For instance, I value the work that East Point is doing. I would like to see East Point materially sustained to be able to continue to do their work. How, do, how would we create the conditions for that to be sustained and even to grow when it's feeding the community and the community wants more without reducing ourselves to a dynamic that privatizes, superficializes, commercializes, and therefore excludes and divides those people who can get access to the value that East Point are providing. And then we'd look at what we already know from our different life experiences about what works well and what doesn't work well. And then we'd look at a, a dream of what it could be if it was allied with our values, but not in the terms of formulating some kind of perfect scheme that we then implement, but in terms of, of testing out the kinds of ideas that, that, that bubble up almost prohibitively in our imagination. Th those particular ideas that you think of and then you immediately think, oh, no, 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 but I couldn't possibly do that. that wouldn't, of course that wouldn't work. That's much too much risk or that's unpractical or... I have so many reasons to, to object to trying that kind of thing. Exactly those things. So we don't have that time. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer you a little one that I pre-baked just as, a, just as a, a, a mini game. And it is incredibly simple. It is simply a question. If you found value in what East Point have been making available with this series of, uh, of events, I recommend that you Look at their website and find out the other wonderful ones that have already happened, which are uh, you can see the recordings of, or future ones which are going to happen. If you'd like that to keep going, what would you like to do to make that possible? Specifically, 
if you can translate what you'd like to do in terms of money, how much money would you like to send their way? And if you have some of the same feeling about the work that I'm talking about here and what we're doing here in Brazil, the same question. And in a moment, uh, Astrid is going to stick up a couple of slides, which will give you two different ways to, to make those financial contributions. If you're in the US or have an international credit card, you can do it um, through one way. And if you want to make a bank transfer, either in US dollars or in euros or in UK pounds, then you'll get that information too. And it'll come in an email later on as well if you want to do that. When we've received all that money, the second part of the process is that uh, Astrid, Chris, other people involved and in me will sit around and we'll just decide where it would be most meaningful for that money to go. So I've told you a little bit about the work that I do and Chris has mentioned a little bit at the beginning, but you don't know too much about what East Point do. So while Astrid gets those slides ready, I'm going to hand over to Chris so he can talk to you for a couple of minutes about the work that they do. And maybe that will give you more of a sense of how you'd like to experience this, this little taste of a dialogical social system. So, Chris. Thanks, Dominic. Yeah, very briefly, East Point Peace Academy, we're in about uh, our sixth year now um, as an organization that for most of that time has been a training organization doing nonviolence and conflict reconciliation trainings. Uh, mostly here in the Bay Area in California uh, and predominantly here in the prison and jails um, in the Bay Area. Uh, in the last, I'd say, year and a half, we've also adopted another focus, which is to play a role in the building up of a national constellation of direct action teams positioned at the intersection of racial healing and climate justice. And so that's become uh, another main focus of our work. Um, similar to the financial co-responsibility model that, that Dominic is sharing about, uh, East Point um, has for the, the life of the organization uh, not charged for anything. So, uh, I was saying that East Point doesn't charge for any of our offerings. None of our events um, have a fee of any kind. And that's been part of our commitment to, to trying to make what we do accessible to as many people as possible. Uh, we work on a gift economy model and we're super excited to experiment um, along the lines of, of Dominic's approach to financial co-responsibility. So thanks for giving me just a chance to at least give you a, a taste of what we're up to. Can I just add, Chris, that you didn't mention that both Kazu and you have written books recently and uh, the time it takes to sustain yourself when you're writing a book is something that in my understanding is, is only possible to do with the support of others. Um, I really want to recommend that people uh, find your books, read your books, read them again gather in groups, read them together, think about them, argue about them, discuss them. Um, and then also consider that level of contribution that you've been making when they, when they think about how they want to help sustain you both. So that's just a little, uh, a little, a little taste of that. And then um, I hope that uh, we will follow up with you all by the, by the email. So you'll find out what happened. Um, the, the, one of the aspects of, of dialogical systems that I so find so valuable is that they do not fear the sharing of information in the same way that the systems that we've been using up till now do. They don't experience um, confidentiality as being an unfortunate but necessary aspect of creating safety because they don't see speech as dangerous. That doesn't mean that they see all speech as equal, all actions as equal. The criteria that a dialogical social system develops is going to be unique to its circumstances. But in general, every time we do work like this, we find that we are simultaneously, even if it's not our main intention, creating spaces where it begins to be safe to speak things which are no longer only individually significant, so they're no, no longer 
on the realm only of preference, of opinion, of personal perspective, but that we start to name things which have validity in a supra-personal way, so beyond just me. And then what happens is that the people who are existing within these dialogical social systems, they also start developing a new curiosity to articulating things that are true beyond themselves. And this seems to me absolutely crucial at the moment because we are losing the ability to articulate something which is valid for everybody. We're focusing in a very healthy and necessary way increasingly on the things that make us distinct, on what is unique about each one of us. But unfortunately, at the same time, almost as if they were in opposition, we are losing our ability to be able to name things that are true for all of us. I personally don't experience that which is true for all of us as being in opposition as that which is my personal preference or my ability to recognize what is unique and distinct about the other. It's very clear to me that I need both and that nothing that pre prefers one over the other is sustainable. Networks don't necessarily reach that stage. A network can be incredibly valuable. It can save lives. It can create the conditions for people to be okay. I work today um, on, a, on a network initiative which has the intention of being able to provide subsistence food to 10 million vulnerable Brazilian families over the next three months. This is a proposal which didn't exist six days ago and is already engaging with hundreds of thousands of people. That's the extraordinary possibility of this meeting, of this moment. I was in a, a meeting uh, three days ago with four people. Ten minutes into the meeting, someone said, this is crazy. Why are we talking about our own development and our group process with just four of us here? We should be sharing this with everybody who's connected to our, to our networks. So I said, okay, so is there a button you can push to make that happen? Thinking that, okay, maybe like, you know, I don't know, 30 other people would now come into this meeting and observe or participate or something. He pushed the button, did a little things. What I didn't understand was that message went to 188,000 people. Of course, not all of them were available and willing to immediately jump on YouTube and watch what we were talking about. But that possibility exists at the moment. That's extraordinary. So these networks have incredible reach, but they don't necessarily reach beyond the implicit dynamics that, under, that underpin the social systems that we currently have. When they start to become conscious of themselves as providing spaces where things that previously couldn't be said start to be able to be said, that is one of the clues we have that they are transitioning towards being uh, a, a sustainable, ongoing configuration of, of, of talents and abilities and, 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 and questions that take care of something fundamental and non-negotiable that is shared between human beings. So one of the ways we can evaluate our journey is that an increase in sincerity is not experienced as being a threat, but is being experienced as being a maturing of our ability to coexist. An increase in our ability to hear and contain difference similarly is experienced not as a diversion from our main intention. Yeah, 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 we'll, we'll listen and understand each other later. At the moment, I've got, a, I've got a, you know, a proposal to finish. I've got a deadline to meet. That's, that's the thinking that still may be existing when networks are functioning. When systems are functioning, no, taking care through a certain quality of presence of our ability to be on the same page and also to not be, to differ, to clash, is seen as being a, a, a key nurturing of that which enables us to stay together. Systems create spaces where conflict is not feared where an absence of conflict is not dreamed of as being some kind of future state of development that we'll reach. 
Whereas in, in, a, in a network, that still might be the case. In a network, you might well experience that conflict derails what you're trying to do and interferes with the functioning of your work. It's a great segue, is, Dominic. It's a great segue for me to make sure that we're tracking time. <laughs> yes, I'm, ju I'm just I'm two, two phrases away from my Expert. ending. They just wanted to make sure you were, you were on it. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for checking. I have to go a little bit beyond time just to just to re remind those of you in North America and Europe that there are other ways to measure time rather than a clock. So, so what's fascinating for me about social systems is that they don't offer as a kind of a, 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 a happy byproduct, a transformation in the human beings that are in, are in within them. It's actually integral within the, the development of community dialogical social systems that the transformation is happening systemically politically collectively it's happening interpersonally and it reflects in my a different understanding that i have of myself and all three of these manifestations are three different reflections of one single movement so I've transcended the idea that, oh, I'm going to work on myself first, and then I, when I'm a better person, then I'll be able to engage with others. Or first of all, we have to work out relationships, then I'll be able to speak my truth. Or first of all, we need a good organizational structure, then we'll be able to take care of ourselves as people and take care of ourselves as individuals. No, it's all one, it's all one movement. And that seems to me to be the the extraordinary opportunity that we have in this incredibly painful complex and dangerous moment we have accidentally a kickstart to move forwards without ex without demanding of ourselves either an order or any kind of preparation or necessarily any kind of understanding of what we're doing and that involves fundamentally that what we're doing now is an act of courage. So I hope that this was in some way valuable, it some way dialogued with the process that you're already in, it nurtured, questioned, provoked something in your thinking. I would love to hear back from you, uh, contest what I'm saying, help me see the limitations of my own view, share your own experiences. You can find me um, on social media, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. Maybe we can put those links in the email that people get, or you can just write me an email. A lot of uh, strength for you in whatever it is that you're dealing with in your immediate circumstances and the people around you. Please take care of yourselves and please take care of each other. Chris. Thank you so much, Dominic, and yeah, wishing the same for you and your loved ones there as well. And thank you everybody for being part of this. Uh, this was uh, a wonderful installment of our speaker series, which is called, Where Do We Go From Here? I just wanna briefly let you know of the upcoming speakers that will be joining us in the coming weeks. Uh, I'll just let you know the next four speakers that are confirmed are Reverend Lanise Pinkert on May 28th, Susan Burton, on June 8th, uh, Nirali Shaw on June 16th, and Rivera Sun on June 22nd. It's an incredible uh, cast of amazing change makers, um, and we would love to, to see you again. Um, I would like to ask Astrid to unmute everybody so that we can shower Dominic with our gratitude as we, as we say goodbye. Thanks so much for being part of this, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so Thank much. You, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dominic. Wonderful.